Does anybody know the play Wit? Whenever anyone answers the question, fine, or the how are you this morning with fine, I think of, we direct, I directed that play a couple of years ago. Whenever she says fine, she's saying it, but she means more than that. Um, this morning, the subject I'm going to talk to you about, I'll get to in just a second, but I wanted to first of all thank uh, Jack Baker and the folks that he works with for inviting me to come and speak with you this morning. I never get tired of talking about movies. The sun's really tinny. Should I take it further away from me? Or oh, I'm fixing it. Um, in fact, and if, if you think that anything I have to say is interesting and you want to read more because you're, it's late at night and you can't um, go to sleep and you need something to do in order to not beat your head against a wall, it sounds really defeatist. Um, anyway, I do keep a film blog if you're interested. And the film blog is called Apt Metaphor, one word, Apt Metaphor at WordPress.com. Uh, the last thing I posted, though, was how much I didn't like the movie God's Not Dead. And I've already talked about that this year, and so it's time to move on. I was busy book this fall, though, and I haven't blogged for a while. This might end up being a blog post or more than one. Um, but let me say this as I begin. Uh, this morning, as I'm talking to you about this subject, let me tell you that this is a driving question for me say, what's wrong with those Christian documentaries? I don't have a succinct five set of answers. Well, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with those Christian documentaries. Here's what happened. I watched some documentaries put out by Christian organizations, including I watched this, which is a promo video for International Justice Mission, which I deeply love and I support and I'm an advocate for this organization. But I also teach film and I don't like watching this. And I thought, why don't I like watching this? I love this organization. I love movies. I think that the moving image is an incredibly powerful medium. So why, when I'm watching this, does my skin crawl a little bit? What's wrong with it? So I'm not saying, hey, there's tons of things wrong with those, those movies. I'm saying, while I'm watching some of these things, I don't like them. Or at least something rubs me the wrong way. And so this question, what it led me to was to explore why those movies that I was watching, including this one which I own, why they were making me uncomfortable. So that's where we begin today. And we're going to go next to watching the trailer for the movie Furious Love. I don't know if anybody's seen this. Okay, um, when I watch the trailer for Furious Love, a few things kind of jump out at me. The first of which is that there's very dramatic music. Now, I know drama. <laughs> I'm a drama queen. I know drama because I teach drama in the moving image and on stage. And there's a lot of drama in this trailer. First, there's this terrific drumbeat, 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 drumbeat. And there's also not just words that are powerful, but also the words are at a quick motion to a slow motion zoom at a very dramatic angle. They're dramatic. They're dramatic titles. They're intended to be dramatic titles. And then I see things like subjective editing. Subjective editing is when you have one picture next to another picture next to another picture next to another picture in a moving image series, and you assume that those things are related to each other. So I see. Um, in this, in this uh, trailer, there was a syringe, there was a woman walking down the street, there was a sign that said Lucifer, and there was a nightclub. And all those things are related. Obviously, they are all together a montage about Satan and about evil. And so I see that the way that the film is constructed is intended to be dramatic and intended to showcase some kind of meaning. And then I see something which kind of sticks out to me, and I don't know if it sticks out to you too. I see a whole bunch of people who are um, African-American or African, I can't tell, 
Um, they might be Asian. Some of them look Indian to me. Um, and they are all possessed. And then I see white people coming and saving them. And that bothers me a little bit, too. And so as much as I go, OK, well, I certainly believe in spiritual warfare. Yes, I do. And I certainly believe that people can be possessed and that it's good for other people to go and pray with them. See how this trailer, which is about a subject matter, which I think I could really get behind, some sub several key things about it that really bother me. One of them is that it uses a lot of dramatic storytelling in order to get you excited about a subject matter instead of the subject matter making you excited. Does that make sense? Like, here's all these titles that are going to get you dramatically excited. The other is that the story it's telling is coming from a point of view which seems to be white-based, I guess is what I'm going to say. All right. So let's uh, make a, a few distinctions here, a couple of distinctions, and then talk a little bit more about how um, those kinds of elements are present. What I would like you to walk away with today is not going, well, those movies are bad movies, but this, that when you watch any movie, especially a documentary, and especially a documentary that's put out by a Christian organization, that you can walk it with, watch it with informed discernment. Oh, well, now that I know a little bit more of what to look for, I can make a better judgment call about how to react to what I'm watching. It's not necessarily all of those things are good or all of those things are bad. I believe that about movies in general. All those movies are bad, all of those movies are good. No, but if I can watch with a little bit of informed discernment, now that I know a little bit more about movies, now that I know a little bit more about documentaries, I can make a better judgment on how to react to what I'm watching. So in order to make it a, an informed discernment, let's make a couple of distinctions. The first talk about is different kinds of documentaries and what a documentary is. So what I have up here is documentary journalism versus branded documentaries for cause marketing. There's actually different types of what documentaries are. I'm going to talk about what quote unquote documentary film is in just a little bit. After we do that, we're going to talk about something which is fundamental to all storytelling, which is visual, especially to documentary storytelling, which is content or what the story is about, the subject matter and form, which is the way that the story is told. So the first distinction we're going to talk about is what different kinds of documentaries are and what documentaries are intended to do. So what is a documentary? Does anybody know? <coughs> I don't know. The general term for a documentary, or the general definition, because it's very broad, a lot of things fall under the net or the umbrella of documentary, is a nonfiction film. Nonfiction meaning that it is not scripted and has actors who are playing fictional characters or a real character if it's a biopic. It's nonfiction. It's true. Now, anything that is a moving image, the way that it deals with what is true and what is not true, that's a little bit dicey. We're going to talk about truth a little bit later, especially in a moving image. But just keep that in mind. What's the definition of a documentary? It's a nonfiction film. And there are different kinds. Now, a lot of people have tried to split documentaries into different subgroups and different genres. And for the purposes of speaking to you today, um, I'm going to cast some fairly broad ones because I'm not talking about just filmed documentaries. And I'm not just talking about different um, um, uh, types of subject matters. I'm talking about different forms. And so uh, the first one we're going to talk about is, is an intention to be journalistic. So the two examples I have up here are Harvest of Shame, which is the Murrow broadcast from the 1960s. It was documentary news. It was a longer news feature, but it was made with moving images because it was made for television. The second one is The Merchants of Cool, which was made on Frontline, uh, for Frontline on PBS. So both of these are made for television, but they're nonfiction, and their intention is they're slightly investigative journalism. Actually, Harvest of Shame really was investigative journalism, but that's their intention, to be um, objective the same way that any journalist um, approaches writing a story. They are simply telling you the story with moving images instead of writing it out on paper or taking pictures and putting it beside something in a magazine. Does that make sense? So that's the journalistic approach to nonfiction. The next is to simply document a real subject. So the 
here. The first is Ken Burns, the National Parks. If you know Ken Burns, he's the guy who's done all of those PBS things. And there's someone who once said, we will now remember American history um, because we will remember Ken Burns' version of American history. His name is put above these things, but he works with a team of people. He has his own style, his own genre. And when you uh, do a certain kind of effect, which is a slow zoom on a still picture, it's called the Ken Burns effect. Ken Burns is documenting American history. And what he's doing is showcasing using letters and actors reading old letters, photographs, and talking with experts. He's showing you a piece of history. So he's documenting the past. Now, certainly this comes from a point of view, but he's not telling you Ken Burns' version. He's telling you in Ken Burns' style. Here are some researched pieces of American history. The next example I have up here is the film Monterey Pop. And the film Monterey Pop was in 1968, and I'm pretty sure that this is D.A. Pennybaker, and I think it's David Mazels who made the film. Um, yeah, it's Pennybaker. Um, Monterey Pop, the movie, was a documentation of the Monterey Pop Festival of 1968. If you don't know, that's the concert where Jimi Hendrix lit his guitar on fire. Um, and you can see Janis Joplin here on the poster, and as you're watching this movie, Penny Baker and Mazels, their intention was to film in a style called cinema verite, which meant that um, they, were, they were not there to be a part of what was happening. They were a fly on the wall. They were observing. They were documenting the subject, hence the term documentation, right? They're documenting the subject so that we have a historical record of what it was like to be at that concert in 1968. Now, if you're watching this particular movie, one thing that you can see is the way that they tried to observe. So they simply begin to show you things. It's, at one point, they show you Janis Joplin's feet. And her feet are frenetically kind of moving as she's singing. And it's a very interesting observation, but that's simply what it is. It's an observation, and its intention is, yeah, to be objective, but it's mostly simply to document. Just like Ken Burns' intention is to say, well, this is a piece of history, and we're going to preserve it so that other people can go back and look at what it was like to experience those places and to experience those things. Documentation. The next example I will give is creative non- um, creative nonfiction, it means that we are documenting a real subject, these are real people, but the people making the movie are telling you a story about them. They would use first person if they were writing it out. So the example over here of Grey, everybody's familiar with this film, thank you Autumn, I feel like I'm wearing a revolutionary costume if that makes any reference to you. Um, there is a musical version of Grey Gardens and that's the best song is when she sings, that's the revolutionary costume. Anyway. Um, the Maisel's brothers made Grey Gardens, and when they did, the Maisel's brothers once said that there are two kinds of stories in a documentary. There's the story you record, and there's the story you find in the footage. So as you're watching your footage, you begin to see themes, you begin to pull them out, you begin to shape a story. And that's what we do when we tell creative nonfiction. We go, well, here's all the truth that I've recorded. And as I do that, let me, let me tell you about this truth, and tell you about that truth, and show you that truth, and shape it into a story to tell you. The other example I have here is Werner Herzog's film, Encounter at the End. And Herzog has made a lot of these kinds of documentaries in which he is the narrator. And he speaks in his very funny German voice. And he's going, when I went to Antarctica, people asked me if I was going to record the penguins. I told them they were not going to be a movie about the penguins. Anyway, when he goes, there's this really nice thing at the beginning of Encounters at the End of the World where he's talking to a person. The person says, if you shake the earth, all the people who aren't tied down fall to the bottom. And that's what Herzog went to do. He went to meet the people who live in Antarctica and interview them. So it is, in a sense, it's not journalism. He's coming from a point of view. He's, he's telling you what he thinks is interesting. And he's talking to people that he thinks would be interesting to talk to. Herzog is fascinated by fascinating people. And every movie he has ever made is prompted by him being fascinated by fascinating people, which is interesting since he is a fascinating person. Anyway. Those would therefore be called something which is, it's certainly not fiction, but it's also not really journalism. It tends to be something which is, it would use I, if it were written out, I went to Antarctica, I met this person. But it's also recording real people, real stories, things like that. The last example I'll give you is an example which is really trendy right now. And it's, uh, it's the cause marketing wave. In other words, we have these documentaries which are put out by a company. The example I'll give you here, here's a headline about it in Ad Week. Could a branded documentary bring home the Oscar? Um, this was a company called Illy, which is 
backing a documentary. I think this one is called Small Section of the World. There's also Damnation, which was um, funded by Patagonia. And they're talking about social problems, but it's a company that's sponsoring them. So they are cause marketing. Hey, watch this movie, because it's a documentary which has a brand attached to it, even though the brand isn't all over it. Um, but what we're doing is we're telling you a truth, but we're trying to expose a social problem. We're trying to get you to pay attention to an idea. There are a lot of movies out there which would fall under this category. Hey, you should pay attention to this. This is a problem. I was talking with a guy, um, it was Terry Linval. It was a while ago we were talking about this, and we were talking with another um, colleague who is a journalist. And I said the, most, uh, the journalism that I'm really paying attention to right now is documentary films. And Terry, who's been a film scholar for years, goes, yeah, me too. There's a lot out there which is really trying to um, bring to light a lot of things which would otherwise not be talked about. And so it's kind of like they would in a magazine or something like that. But the, the, the thing that I also want you to pay attention to here is that when we do this, we tend to sell an idea. Remember, this has the words brand and marketing in it. So yeah, it's about a cause, and it's about paying attention to a social ill, but it's also about sales. It, it really is. And it's about selling an idea, because that's a lot of how advertising works. You sell an idea. Hey, Coke is about everybody. If that's the case, is it OK to sell an idea? Well, what I will say is, it's fraught with pit holes, pitfalls. <laughs> it's Friday. I don't know. It's fraught with pitfalls. <laughs> the next distinction I want to talk about is the distinction between content and form. So if we have different kinds of truths, if we have these different kinds of real stories, what goes into the making of a nonfiction film? In all films, we talk about content and we talk about form. Content. This is what the story is about. This is the story of Dracula. This is the story of you name it. Um, but the form is how that story is told. How are we going to shoot it? How are we going to edit it? Who's going to be in it? Is it going to be dark? Is it going to be bright? If you are a filmmaker, you make all of those decision, decisions all of the time. What is this going to look like? What is the style like? Is it supposed to leave people feeling excited? Is it supposed to leave people feeling angry? You can shape a lot of perception based on how you use form. Example, how many of you have been to Africa? Several of you, yes. Several of you have not. How many of you have seen The Lion King? Probably most of you, if not all. Part of your perception of Africa is based on The Lion King. It is, because you've not been to Africa, but that's set in Africa, you know it, because those are lions. That's Africa. How many of you have been to New York City? Several, a lot of you, but not all. How many of you who have not been to New York City, you don't have to raise your hands, have seen a television show set in New York City? Yeah, all of you have. How many of you have been to rural Minnesota? Several of you. How many of you have seen episodes of Little House on the Prairie? Little House on the Prairie looks suspiciously like Southern California, not Minnesota, because it was shot in Simi Valley, California, where they also shot Bonanza and lots of things. In fact, if you notice when you watch the show, it almost never snows there. And sometimes it snows while there are leaves on the trees, which is pretty amazing, because I don't remember that happening very often in Michigan, although sometimes it snows at the end of March. Anyway, um, <clears throat> your perception of a place can be very influenced by what you see in television and in movies. And if that's the case, the form, the way that it's shot, it's shot in California, even though it's set in Minnesota, that's what Minnesota looks like, right? Never having been there, I won't know the difference. Um, the form is going to affect your perception. The form is shaped by filmmakers. It's a decision that is made, even if it is a nonfiction film. Content and form, the distinction is important. When you're talking about nonfiction, when we're talking about documentary, um, when we talk about subject matter and storytelling choices, it's important to understand that what's being said is inextricably bound up in how it is being said. Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is the message. What's being said is inextricably bound up in how it's being said. Even if the content is spot on, something that you totally believe, the form can make a difference in the way that you perceive it. Content. Content in a nonfiction film is, in general, based on 
found footage or recorded footage of a real event, a lot of research. Uh, we do a lot of interviews with experts or people who are um, uh, knowledgeable on the subject or firsthand a part of what's going on. There is usually an intention to inform. They're quite often educational, at least in some respect. There is sometimes an intention to document or record or preserve for posterity. And sometimes there is also an intention to sell an idea. And we've been talking a lot about that. And I want you to just continue to kind of let that you know, brew in your head, the idea that we're selling an idea and it, you know, what we think about that. Why is the story being told? That's one important question to ask when we're talking about the content or the subject matter of a story. Why are we learning about this subject? What are the intentions of the filmmaker? Why are they telling me about this subject matter? So keep those questions in mind. Now, when we talk about the form of nonfiction storytelling, we're talking about things like A role and B role. A role is usually either event or interview. Sometimes B-roll is interview, sometimes B-roll is cutaways to other things. So what is the predominant footage? This is a footage that's really telling us the story. That's A-roll. And what is the footage that's helping supplement that? That's B-roll. And every person who documents takes A-roll and B-roll. Right, Jacob? Yep. The story sometimes is found in the editing room. I talked about that with Grey Gardens. The Maisel's brother said, there's the story you record and there's the story that you find. And you shape it in the editing room. There are extant documents photographs, letters, footage, part of your research. There's point of view, so who has the camera? We're going to get back to that in a little bit. And there's also something which every movie has, which is dramatic music and titles. Now, Walter Murch, who's the sound editor for Apocalypse Now and the editor for a lot of films like The Conversation, he wrote a book called In the Blink of an Eye, and it's just a really interesting book if you're interested in editing. He said that music, and he worked a lot with music and he worked a lot with sound, he said music should not tell you how to feel. It should express the way the film feels already. If you're in my intro to film class, hi Emma, Emma's in my intro to film class, we're going to talk next week we're going to talk about E.T. because E.T. has this beautiful soundtrack composed by John Williams. And it's flying and it embodies transcendence. And if you watch the movie without the music, you feel like you need something. Or is it telling you how to feel and you're watching a horror movie or a thriller and you know something bad is going to happen because there's this big dramatic music. Now, this is a little bit subjective. It's a little bit of a gray area. Is the music telling me how to feel or expressing how I feel already? I don't know. You're going to have to decide. But that question is really important. The dramatic music and titles, do they help tell the story or do they lay the story on you, lay the emotion on you? So a couple of questions to ask especially considering point of view, who has the camera, who is telling this story? So if this is a nonfiction story, who's telling it? And whose story is it to tell? And how do we do the story justice? If there is the truth of the story, the subject matter, and then there is the form, whose story is it to tell? And how do we do that story justice? Let's keep those in mind as we watch a clip from Invisible Children. Oh, let me get this ad out of your way. Okay, I'm going to stop us for just a second. Um, this is a terrible subject, right? I mean, the subject is, it's an atrocity. But when I watch this, one thing that kind of bothers me is this. They didn't put down the camera and help the boy. They show the light on the boy, and they keep following him. They don't help him. Also, he doesn't have a name. They name somebody talking about it, but they don't name the boy. I don't know his name. I don't know who he is. I'm never going to see him again, and I don't get to know him. He's there to make me feel bad about what he's going through. But it's his story, and he has no part in the telling of it. And that bothers me a little bit. Now, granted, I think that you know, there's a lot of admirable stuff happening here. But it bothers me a little bit that that's the case. And sometimes it's impossible to do. Sometimes you have to tell people stories for them. Yes, true, but, but keep this in mind. Even if that's not always possible, isn't it an ideal we should strive for? Now, I don't know how many of you have seen Invisible Children. I'm going to jump ahead to this clip here. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to stop for just a little bit. Um, this is a selfie. It is. It's a selfie. Um, and as much as I'm, I don't know these guys, I don't know them personally, I've watched a little bit of their movie. But I think that they have a lot of really wonderful things in their hearts because they want to go help people. And I think that that's incredibly admirable. However, they're taking a selfie of their trip. And so once again, what we're documenting here is not the story of the African children and the struggle they are going through. We're documenting the white guys who are going to go over and help them. Do you see the difference? Now again, it's not to say that to, oh, I can't watch that movie because it's evil. No. You can learn a lot from these kinds of films. There's a lot to take away which is helpful. But this fundamental shift, the difference between the selfie and someone else being able to tell their own story, I think that's really important, especially because if I watch this movie and I don't feel like I need to help these people or give something to this organization, then am I a bad person? Flannery O'Connor once said, and I'm going to get to this quote in a second, but she also once said, I doubtless hate pious language as much as you do because I believe in the reality it represents. She once said that to a friend. I doubtless hate pious language, religious talk. I hate it as much as you do. And she was saying it to a non-Christian friend. Because I believe in the realities it hides. The thing that I'll put that beside is not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will be saved. So we can talk, great Christian talk. But sometimes when we're talking that talk, we're missing the reality, which it actually represents. I really struggle with that sometimes because I certainly believe that being in a Christian culture and in a Christian environment is a wonderful thing. But sometimes I wish we didn't always talk about some of these things because they're a little bit too precious to be talked about to me. Because I don't want them to be empty. I, re I believe in the realities they hide. And so to say it, oh, you know what, could you wait until you really, really mean it? It's a thought. O'Connor also once said, when tenderness is detached from the source of tenderness, its logical outcome is terror. It ends in forced labor camps and in the fumes of the gas chamber. Uh, O'Connor is writing in the 50s and 60s, so when she's talking about gas chambers, what is she talking about? Yeah, the Holocaust. She's talking about the, the Holocaust, the German Holocaust of the Jews. Generally, the Jews are the people as well. It ends in forced labor camps and in fumes of the gas chamber. She says tenderness. And she's talking about caring. And she's talking about emotion. So you'll notice that my title up here says, what's wrong with a little emotional manipulation? Well, yeah, well, shouldn't we feel bad for that terrible situation? How did the gas chambers start? Now, I'm not a history scholar. I'm, and I, if you talk with um, people who know more about this subject, you'll learn a lot more than I do. Um, but I, I do know this, that part of what led to the Nazis being in power was a sense of, Yes, that's right. We should be proud to be Germans. Yes, things are bad. It was, it was, we were motivated by a lot of emotional appeal. And that emotional appeal was propitiated by something called propaganda. What's propaganda? Storytelling. <laughs> it's, it's storytelling with a purpose. And it's an intention to persuade you to believe something. Now. Is all propaganda bad? Do the ends justify the means? I don't know, but it's certainly worth considering. When, when tenderness is detached from the source of tenderness, it can lead to terror. Its logical outcome, she says, is terror. Propaganda, emotional manipulation, you ought to believe this. See how bad this is? See how great this is? See how terrible those people are? See how good these people are? That can get really dangerous if we don't apply the other ways in which we discover truth, right? The Wesleyan Quadrilateral says, it's, yes, it's experience. It certainly is emotion, experience, but it's also reason and scripture and tradition. We discover truth through more than just the way that we feel. What's wrong with a little emotional manipulation? Um, it can be fraught with, what did I say earlier? Pit holes. It can be fraught with pit holes or pitfalls or potholes, any of them. Pick one, Jen. Let's watch another clip. Uh, I stand here, by the way. Watch it here.
All right, I'm going to pause this for a second. This goes on for quite a while. It's a long take, so we in the business call a long take. Um, this is from a 2006 film called The War Tapes. The War Tapes was made with the intention of letting people tell their own story. So what the filmmakers did was gather uh, mini DV cameras and distribute them to a National Guard unit and said, go tell your story. And that's what they did. Now, granted, the National Guard uh, members did not edit the film. Filmmakers did. But notice how a lot of it is preserved in things like a long take. Um, in general, a long take means that you're preserving one story. The more editing, the more artifice. That's just a rule in storytelling. The more we cut, the more that we can change time, the more that we can change point of view, the more that we can add subjective meaning. So the fundamental shift here that I just wanted to illustrate with this movie, and I'm not saying that this movie is good and other movies are bad, is that this is coming from a point of view in which the person who is taking part in the story is telling their own story. Now this particular movie kind of starts off with definitely a very emotional scene because they're under attack, but notice that this isn't about someone coming in and going, I'm filming a National Guard unit. It's about someone who is in the National Guard who's actually out on patrol. It's a difference in point of view. Another point or another part of form that's important to talk about is if we're talking about how people tell their stories, um, it's not always possible for someone to have the camera coming from their point of view. Sometimes you have to interview them. So the first example I have up here is Errol Morris, and in this picture over here he's interviewing Donald Rumsfeld for his film, which is called The Unknown Known. Morris actually invented um, a machine, or it was invented at his behest, which is called the Interatron. And the intention of the Interatron, if you can't see from this diagram here, is that when he's looking at the screen, Errol Morris is looking at Donald Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld is talking to the camera, but Donald Rumsfeld sees Errol Morris. So he is looking at the person he's speaking to, and the camera is recording him straight on. That's what Errol Morris wanted. He said, I want to be able to talk to the person I'm speaking to, and I want to have them speaking directly to the camera, but then see me. That way, when you watch The Unknown Known or some of his other movies, you see someone who is speaking directly to the camera, but they are talking to you. So the, the, the shift in point of view here is that instead of having us, the, um, the audience, go where the person in the story is, we are now shifted into the seat of the person who is the interviewer. Does that make sense? Whenever you have point of view, whenever you put the camera somewhere, you put the audience there too. And so now we put the camera directly addressing the subject matter. It's an interesting idea that he, he does. Um, in the same article where I saw this picture, um, Errol Morris said the following. It's an article in Movie Maker Magazine. He said, style doesn't guarantee truth. How could it? How could style guarantee truth? What's essential is the spirit of inquiry. Style doesn't guarantee truth. He's talking about documentaries because he's a documentarian. Well, the way that you do it can't guarantee truth. What's important, he says, is that you have a spirit of inquiry, that you're looking for the truth. Now, Jen, I don't know, does, does that mean that the truth is subjective? That can't be right. No, the truth isn't subjective, but the way that we perceive it and how we are told to perceive it, that is subjective. The form is definitely subjective. The form can always be shaped, and the form can always be manipulated. Another example of an interview that I'm going to talk about is Werner Herzog. I've already mentioned him already. Um, in an interview he did for the film Encounters at the End of the World. But before we do, we're going to watch a clip from the movie Nefarious. Um, Nefarious Merchant of Souls is about human trafficking. And let me once again remind you that this is a subject matter I'm really passionate about. And for the most part, I think that a lot of this movie is done very, very well. But I'm going to use it as an example to tell you that even when I'm watching a movie and I go, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that there's a lot of integrity to this filmmaking as well as to the subject. There's still things that they kind of rub me the wrong way. Autumn, will you show us the clip, please?
You can stop there, Autumn. I'm, sorry. I'm asking Autumn to stop because I get really uncomfortable watching this. The reason I get uncomfortable is not because she's talking about her calling out on the name of Christ. I think that's great. It's because this is a private moment. And as much as she might be able to share it and that might be really powerful, I don't want to see it in a movie. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's because I'm a filmmaker. Maybe it's my personality. I don't know. But I don't want her to have to go through that on the screen for me. And I don't know if you're familiar with this lady. I'm trying to remember her name. It now escapes me. But she's the person who runs Hookers for Jesus. She's got a great testimony, an incredible testimony. And I would love to hear it, except watching her break down on the screen, I don't want to put her in an uncomfortable position because she's somebody who I feel has already been victimized. It's a movie about victimization. And so for me to watch her go through pain again, it feels like voyeurism. Voyeurism is pleasure in looking, and it's to look without permission. It's often, it often has sexual connotations, but not necessarily. We've now put it kind of into modern language. A person likes to see, uh, like seeing and like talking or writing about something that's considered to be private. It's to look without permission. And so when I'm watching someone have an emotional breakdown on film, I feel really uncomfortable because I feel like a voyeur. I feel like I'm watching something that I wasn't supposed to watch. Maybe it's just my personality. I don't know. It's something that I consider. And I compare it to Herzog telling a story or giving an interview. And this one example I'm going to give you is one of my favorite moments um, of an interview ever that I've watched on screen. This is from Encounters at the End of the World. Okay, he's going to go on to, um, to show Herzog um, that his entire life is packed in this rucksack, which he can take on any airplane. So he can literally travel anywhere he wants with everything he owns at any time. This man is from the Eastern Bloc. And the thing that, I, that interests me, at least as a counterpoint as I'm watching this interview, is that he begins to really struggle with the subject matter. And if I were watching and, and I were a filmmaker, I could go, now's my chance. Here's my movie. This guy breaks down. I have a huge emotional moment on screen. And Herzog doesn't do that. He says, you don't have to talk about it. That's a private moment. And then he deflects for just a second. He takes the pressure off and says, for me, the greatest description of hunger is a description of bread. The greatest description of freedom is what you have in front of you. And then redirects the conversation to something that the gentleman feels comfortable with, describing the contents of his rucksack. Now, I don't know how many of you have taken an interpersonal communication class of some kind with Dr. Patton or with Mary Darling, but I think the principles of being able to listen and respond to someone and understand what they want to share, what they're comfortable sharing, the doors that they should open, the doors that they should not open, and how to exploit them with our language, I think there's a lot to compare here, at least to consider. This kind of interview, it's not as dramatic. It's not as dramatic, and it doesn't play as well on film. But it does a lot more justice to someone being able to keep what's private to them private to them. Now, granted, I think in the other interview, I think she wants to share that. It may be a private moment, but she definitely wants to share it. But it still feels private to me, and it feels like an intrusion to watch. Who is telling the story? Whose story is it to tell? Why are we hearing this story? What are the intentions of the filmmaker? These questions, again, are things that we can then really have in mind when we're thinking about things like editing and point of view and drama. And these are questions that we've been asking regarding nonfiction for a long time. Because nonfiction, nonfiction moving image, the documentary, purports to be true, purports to be about real things, even though Picasso once said um, that art is a lie that reveals a deeper truth. Um, how do we know that it's true? How do we know that this nonfiction story we're watching is true? That's been negotiable as long as we've been making nonfiction moving images. This is two stills in the poster from Nanook of the North, which was made in the 1920s. Robert Flaherty took his camera to Hudson Bay, and he recorded Inuit people. 
Now, this is a documentary. Here is Nanook throwing a spear to stab a seal. What you don't know is that while that is Nanook, and he certainly is an Inuit, and he is a native person, and this is his life, he would much rather use a gun. In fact, Flaherty, who you can see him here with his camera, um, Flaherty was chided by a lot of people for directing his non-actors. No, 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 use the spear. It looks much more authentic. It'll play better on screen. So even though this is a true story of real people, these are not actors. Ninnick, by the way, is really, really famous. Uh, uh, Flaherty's wife said she was in Germany like in the 50s, and she saw like a snowball, like the German version of the, the, the snowball treat, and it had Ninnick's picture on the top of it, that he was known around the world because this movie was so famous. Um, it, it, he was not a movie star. He became a movie star, even though he was um, an Inuit person, not an actor living in Hollywood. Um, Flaherty always, was always chided for, for doing that. There's always a negotiation between um, capturing the truth and the way that we capture it and the way that we shape it. There is uh, no subjective truth to the fact that Nanook is an Inuit person, but how Inuit he seems is subjective in the way that he was directed and shot in the film. Also note that when we are watching something, we intend for it, to, for it to entertain us. The most pejorative of all 21st century terms is the word boring. We hate things that are boring. And so if it's on television, it better entertain us. Now, I've read a lot about um, reality television, and I was actually, in the book that I was working on this fall, I did an entire chapter on Top Chef which is fascinating because it's about cooking and it's about gourmet cooking. And I'm sure that it kind of gets dramatic um, when, you're, when you're cooking something. I don't know about for you, but as I'm watching shows like this, I can't help but think about how they dramatize real life events. And suddenly I think, yeah, I was gonna get that out of the dryer. And all of a sudden I realize I forgot to put my pants in the dryer. Whoa! And it's really dramatic, right? Because that's the way people talk on a reality television show. You also know that they shape reality television shows to be more dramatic. It's in order to entertain you. They entice you with them. Not only do they set up dramatic situations, they also use a roll footage of an event and somebody drops a knife or something. And then they have B roll footage of somebody doing this. And then they have C, they have the voiceover, which they've franken bit, that's a term, franken biting to take something that somebody says out of context. Um, they take C, the sound of somebody going, I can't believe he did that. And they put them all together. You have somebody dropping a knife, you have somebody doing this, and you have somebody saying, I can't believe he did that. And suddenly you have entertainment. It's found in the editing room, and all reality television is shaped that way. There's a formula. No one's life is that exciting. Only reality television could make Paris Hilton exciting. Only editing. If there's intention to entertain, even in this, then there's something that needs to keep you watching. So it isn't enough to just tell you the story. They have to tell you the story in such a way as to get you to watch. Does that make sense? Next, if you're compelled by the story that you're watching, one important distinction that you can make is, am I being compelled by the subject matter, by the thing the story is about, or am I being compelled by the storytelling? And I've tried to give you some examples here so that while you're watching, you can go, okay, wait a minute. As I'm watching the titles, as I'm watching the music and the editing, I think those things are what, what's getting me really exciting. What if I turn off the sound for a little bit? Or what if I just stop and I just look at this picture? Do I feel the same way? Or is it the dramatic music, the dramatic titles? Is it those things which are, are really getting me to invest in what's happening? Is it the content or the form which is compelling you? Documentary is intended to compel you with content. That's what it strives to do because it is nonfiction. Or at least that is the ideal. I kept this still. It's from um, a movie. That I don't even know the name of the movie. And it was put out as a Christian documentary by an organization. Um, and I just wanted to use it as an example because it's just a little too blatant. And it's not to say that there are not um, groups of every creed, color, shape, and size who also misuse things about the moving image. But um, this is from a, 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 what is very obviously some branded marketing 
um, or branded documentary for cause marketing, which is a cause for an idea. We should think this way about this. Um, and what you, I don't know if you can see it because I had to pause it and it wouldn't let me get rid of the play button. It says, it will be the criminalization of Christianity. It's a title. Does anyone know what the things surrounding it are? They're festival laurels. What are festival laurels? When a, when a film goes to a film festival, you put the laurels beside it and you put the name of the film festival there. And it means that it was an entry at a film festival. Now it takes a lot to do that. I don't know about you, but if you sent out your film to like 60 film festivals and it's been rejected by all of them except the one that says that it accepts it and then you get there and you realize it's a horror film festival and you say, please take me off of your list. Now that that's happened to me, it happened to me. Um, um, you realize that those festival laurels are really hard to get. <laughs> Um, because there are a lot more film festivals than they used to be, and there are some which are, have, they have more um, uh, weight, I guess is what I'll say, in the film community. But uh, these have been arbitrarily placed around a title to make it look important because they've seen it on other documentaries. Do you hear where I'm going with this, right? That they were not paying attention to the filmmaking form. When you see festival laurels on the front of a, um, a poster or the front of a DVD cover, or if you see them in the titles of a film, um, they usually, in the trailer, they usually denote this is where it was accepted. So it's been screened here or it won this award. In this case, it's simply to make what they're saying look more important. If what you're saying isn't important enough on its own, that you, if, if, if what you need in order to get people to pay attention to it are festival laurels, then I think you need to rethink what you're saying. Does that make sense? Okay. How does the movie ask you to respond? This is another thing that you can pay attention to, and I know I need to wrap up here, so I'm going to do it quickly. Um, if the movie is asking you to respond and you would feel guilty if you did not respond to it, if you didn't give money to it, why? I don't know about you, but I've, I've, I've watched movies that made me so frustrated that I'm, I'm a runner. At least I like to think I am. I used to be. Um, I haven't run for a while this winter. Um, I had to go out and run. I was so angry about what I saw, about the truth that was revealed to me in a moving image. Also, well, I'm going to get to that in a second, so I'll skip it for now. When you're responding to a movie, if, if it makes you feel guilty, what's making you feel guilty? Are you supposed to feel guilty? Are you supposed to be compelled to do something, give money? If you can give a subject money and move on with your life, is that OK? Ah, I, think I just I gave my $20. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Awesome. I'm going to go back to playing on my iPad. Is that what the intention of the documentary was to do? Is that OK? Would you, what should you do with the information you now have? Should you learn more? Do you know enough? How much do you think you know now that you've seen the movie? I watched a movie about that, so I know all about it. Or I watched this movie, it made me really interested. I wanted to learn more, so I started reading books, and eventually I went there, that kind of thing. And a couple of thoughts, just to kind of keep it in mind, about what it means to um, go and help a cause. Uh, some of you may have heard of toxic charity. I, I put that up there, even though I kind of did it uh, because I've only read parts of it, and I don't know it as, as well. But I also put up this post that Wally put up while we were in India last year. And it's a post about visiting the missionaries of charity and how useless we all felt when we went there. Because even though we were going to Mother Teresa's organization and we were volunteering and we were going to go help people, we realized that they had all the volunteers that they needed and they had us cut bandages because they were giving us something to do. A lot of people go because they're visiting a landmark. They're visiting Mother Teresa's organization. And we realized that we were not going for other people. We were going for us so that we could feel better about helping people. And that's not to say that everyone who walks in to help Mother Teresa's organization or everyone who goes on a mission trip, by all means, that it's not all, it's, it's, all, it's always all about you. No. But you should check your intention. Is this really about helping people or is it about getting your picture next to some poor kids in another country to show how, how much of a heart you have? Something to keep in mind. When I take students to India, when we're sitting in the airport about to leave, and we have this conversation throughout the trip, and I think this is what happens on a lot of cross-cultural trips, I really do. Um, I say, look, now you're responsible for this information. I don't know how this changes you. I don't know if you go back and you recycle more. I don't know if you go back and you change your major. I don't know if you go back and you decide you're going to do this or you're going to do that or you're simply going to live more responsibly. You're going to meet more people to do this. For me, my response to India is that I have to go back. 
I have, to, I have to say, listen, you need to pay attention to this. I saw this, and I can't help but think about it all the time. And you have to think about it, too. Because when I'm sitting in my nice, warm, comfortable American house, I'm thinking about people who live somewhere else, and 50 of them could live in my house. And if only I could gather up a lot of those kids and let them run in my yard, because they have to run in the street, right? Now, I've watched movies, and that compelled me, but going there, compelled me more, because I understand that a movie is a movie. Yes, it's a piece of truth. Yes, it can give you an idea. But that truth is always shaped a little bit. It's always intended to entertain. And it's not, it's, it's not an end in itself. Watching a movie wasn't enough for me. The thoughts I want to leave you with are this. I just I thought both of these pictures were funny. There's this really nice um, meme, which is, went to the moon, took five photos, went to the bathroom, took three photos. Um, and the nice, uh, um, very Anglo Jesus saying, I give them life and they gave me selfies. Uh, how much of the movies that we watch are intended to be self-gratuitous? We're watching them because we want to watch us. We're watching them because we want some kind of emotional satisfaction. And if the movie we're watching doesn't give us emotional satisfaction, then we really don't have time for it. If the subject matter is compelling, but, you know, I, I don't know. I have a hard time paying attention to those kinds of things because I really like the things that, you know, like they have all that music and stuff. If the, if the subject matter isn't compelling enough without those things, then are we really being compelled by the subject matter? Or are we watching something because we like the way that it makes us feel? And I think that's really important to ask. All storytelling offers a way of seeing. It says, look, th this is something worth looking at. Is it true? Well, it, it's true in some ways, at least. It's worth considering. Now what are you going to do with it? All of it requires critical thought. It will require discernment. Even if it is a true story, if it's a moving image, it's intended to entertain you and it's shaped. Check your motivation to respond. Why are you responding and to what are you responding? Look at the moving image for what it is. All movies change perception. All movies wrestle with truth. None of them are the same as real life. None of them are complete, apparent truth. All of them are shaped.